Well, hi, everybody. This is Don Stewart, and welcome to episode 17, Angels, God's Invisible Messengers. We're on question number 21, who is Michael the Archangel? And last time we left you mentioning three points about Michael. First of all, according to the book of Daniel, he's called one of the chief angels. One of the chief angels, meaning there must be more, but we're not given the names of any other ones. Number two, we're told he supported another angel who was sent by God to answer a prayer of Daniel, but this other angel was thwarted in some sense in the unseen realm by someone called the Prince of Persia, uh, the, or the Prince of the Kingdom of Persia, whatever you want to call him, and uh, Michael helped him. So Michael is more powerful, it seems, than any of the angels of the devil, as it were, because he was sent to help this other angel. And then we left with the idea that Michael will have an end times ministry. He has a prominent role in the end. This is from Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 to 4, where it says, uh, At that time, Michael, the great commander, will stand on behalf of the descendants of your people, Israel. Now, this is what Daniel was told, that Michael will stand up at, during this time of trouble. And so Michael will have an end times ministry. Now, this is from the Old Testament. Now, we're now uh, number four, and we go to the New Testament here. Michael is possibly the archangel mentioned in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, some people think it's Michael specifically who is mentioned here. Here's what the Bible says. For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That's 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. While the identity of this chief angel or archangel is not stated, it is most likely Michael, all right? However, it's also likely that the voice here is not the voice of the archangel, but actually the voice of the Lord himself, who has an archangel-like voice or a powerful voice. So uh, it's pos if it is an archangel it's speaking of, it's most likely Michael. If it's just comparing the voice of the Lord when he shouts, when he descends from heaven at the time of the rapture of the church, then it's just a powerful voice similar to that of an archangel. All right, number five. Uh, here's a fascinating episode. We're told that Michael disputed with Satan over the body of Moses. Now, in Jude 9, we're told that Michael the archangel contended with Satan over the body of Moses. And Jude wrote about an episode here, but an episode that is not contained in the Old Testament. It says this, but even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Again, that's Jude 9. Now, this is the only passage where he specifically called an archangel or a chief angel. That's what the Greek word means. Now, interestingly, the Living Tra New Living Translation puts it this way. But even Michael, one of the mightiest of the angels, did not dare accuse Satan of blasphemy, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. This took place when Michael was arguing with Satan over Moses' body. Now, a couple of things here. Number one, this is something that is not mentioned in the Old Testament. So Jude has access to something that occurred in the life of Moses that... Um, Again, Scripture did not record uh, in the Old Testament period during the first five books of the Bible when um, we told Moses, you know, was um, died in the end of Deuteronomy. Remember that he and God buried him somewhere there, overlooking, um, you know, the Promised Land. But we find from Jude nine something happened that wasn't recorded in the Old Testament. There is dispute about the body of Moses between Satan and Michael the archangel was the one who disputed him. But what's fascinating here, Michael did not say, I rebuke you as the archangel. He said, the Lord rebuke you. Now, this is interesting because remember, Michael seemingly had power over all the other angels there because in this passage in Daniel, when this kingdom of prince of the kingdom of Persia tried to thwart a, a godly angel from answering Daniel's prayer, Michael intervened. But see, we're dealing with another character here, and that is Satan, the adversary, the devil, who is more powerful than the angels. He is he was a created being, uh, probably the most beautiful, most powerful created being that God made, an anointed cherub. The cherubim are a higher order than the angels. And so uh, when Michael, uh, again, faced off with Satan, the devil, he said, the Lord rebuke you. You know, what a great lesson for us. If we have a spiritual battle and we feel that Satan is hassling us or Satan's hassling someone else, 
we always want to say, the Lord rebuke you. I've heard so many times in the past, unfortunately, people say, I rebuke you, Satan. No, we don't rebuke Satan. <laughs> we put the Lord between us and Satan. It's a great lesson here from Jude 9. All right. Now, speaking of Satan, there's another example uh, in the book of Revelation where he will actually war against Satan. That is, Michael, the archangel, and his angels will engage with a war in a war with the devil. And we read about this in uh, Revelation 12, 7 to 9. We mentioned this, too, about uh, the work of angels, the ministry of angels in the book of Revelation. We'll talk about it again here for a second. It says, then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. That's uh, Revelation 12, 7 to 9. And again, as we've mentioned before, there's many fascinating things about this. This is during the last seven-year period, the seventh week of Daniel, the Great Tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. There's this war in heaven, and Michael, the archangel, battling Satan, his angels, overcomes him. And Satan is now thrown down to earth, along with his angels during that period of time, because they overcome Satan's army. God gives them the power and the strength to do it here. And so they do prevail at this particular time. And so this is a fascinating episode of what's still to happen, still to take place at the time of the end. Now, finally, number seven, it seems best to say Michael is the messenger of law and judgment. After we look at the totality of scripture, what it has to say about Michael, this chief angel or this archangel, he seems to be the messenger of law and judgment. So this sums up the specific passages in scripture where Michael the archangel appears. As we have seen, he is prominent in carrying out God's program both here on earth as well as in the heavenly realm. We don't know a whole lot about him, but we do have some really interesting uh, episodes about Michael and what he's done in the past, as well as what he will do in the future. So to summarize, question 21, who is Michael the Archangel? Well, there is much confusion about the identity and ministry of Michael the Archangel. From looking at the scripture, we can conclude the following about this personage. First, he is the only archangel specifically named in scripture. No other angel is given this title. However, since he is called one of the chief princes, there obviously are other angels of this rank, yet none of them are named for us in the Bible. Now, his authority and rank is seen by the fact he actually supports this other angel in spiritual warfare. So Michael is obviously a powerful being. Now, Daniel the prophet also wrote that Michael would have a prominent role in the end times. He seems to have some connection with the nation Israel and their destiny. And this is also confirmed in the book of Revelation, where Michael and his angels are at war with Satan during the time of the end. And we mentioned this episode that Jude records that's not found in the Old Testament of Michael the archangel disputing with Satan over the body of Moses. And as we emphasized, as powerful as Michael is, he rebukes Satan, not in his own name, but in the name of the Lord, because he could not overcome Satan in his own strength. So this sums up the little information we have concerning Michael the archangel. Now, there's a question about Michael we're going to deal with in question 22 that often comes up. Is it possible to identify Michael the archangel with Jesus? And someone's going to say, wait, 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 we know, no, it's not. Well, let's listen to the question here, because it's not probably what you think it is. There have been those who attempted to equate Michael the archangel with Jesus. In other words, that they're the same person. Some feel that Michael is Jesus Christ appearing in a temporary form, such as Christ did as the angel of the Lord, like the angel of the Lord that appeared to Abraham on Mount Moriah. Now, here's the point. This is a different view than the Jehovah's Witness have, the Watchtower and Bible at Track Society, Watchtower Bible and Track Society. At the outset, we must note that this is a different, this is different than the view of the Watchtower. The Watchtower believes Jesus Christ is a created being who was Michael the angel, archangel in the Old Testament. Now, of course, this view is totally incompatible with what the Bible says about Jesus. The question we are addressing here is not that um, Michael, uh, a created being, is the same as you know God the Son, Jesus Christ in the New Testament. The question we're addressing here, was Michael actually the pre-incarnate Christ? In other words, was this Jesus 
uh, God, the, well, God the Son at this time, appearing uh, as this chief angel in certain instances in the Old Testament, such as intervening for this uh, other angel that was thwarted for answering the prayer of Daniel. Now, here's people that make this case. Let's look at it. You may not have heard this one before, but here's the case that is made. The arguments for Michael's identification as being the pre-incarnate Christ are as follows. Number one, Michael is the chief prince and protector. Michael is called the chief prince of God's people. He is also called the protector of the people of Israel. The Bible also teaches that the Lord is the one who protects or keeps Israel in Psalm 121, verses 2 through 6. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither sleep, will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. That's Psalm 121, verses 2 through 6. So the argument goes like this. If the Lord is the one who is, protects or keeps Israel, and Michael is the one who's called the protector of the people of Israel, then Michael must be the Lord who is protecting the people of Israel in the Old Testament. So again, Michael is just another name for Jesus, the pre-incarnate Christ, not a created being, but it's just another name for Jesus is how the argument goes. All right, number two. Christ will give a command like the angel. The Bible says that when Christ returns, he will come with the voice or a cry of command of the archangel. We're making that point over and over again. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, the Greek text makes it clear that it's not an archangel or a, an archangel that's doing this. It's the voice of the archangel, a specific archangel uh, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. All right. Since Christ comes with the voice of the archangel, the argument goes that he must be that archangel in the Old Testament. And the only archangel mentioned in the Bible is Michael, the archangel. All right. Let's respond to this argument because it just doesn't work. The biblical evidence does not substantiate the idea that Michael the archangel is actually God the Son, Jesus Christ. We'll make a few points about this. Number one, Michael only has authority over other angels. The fact that Michael is called a chief prince only means that he has the authority over other angels, not over everything that exists. There is no statement in scripture that says Michael has authority over all things. And here's the big reason why. Jesus is never called the chief prince. In addition, he's never called the chief prince. To the contrary, he is king of kings and lord of lords. Revelation 19, 16, it says at his return on his robe and thigh was written the title king of kings and lord of lords. That's a much higher title than chief prince. Though Michael has protected Israel, it is as God's representative. It is ultimately the Lord, not Michael, who is protecting or keeping his chosen people. And the one that really destroys it is Daniel 10, 13, where it says, Michael is one of the chief princes. That's what he's called in Daniel 10, 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia opposed me 21 days. So Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And I left him there with the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Again, Daniel 10, 13. Now, this means that Michael is one of a group of princes. Now, we don't know how large the group is, but certainly he is not in a class by himself. On the other hand, Jesus Christ, God the Son, is the unique Son of God. In fact, the Gospel of John tells us this in John 1, 18. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. So Jesus is different than all the angels or all humans. He is God the Son. He is not Michael the archangel. And number four, Christ comes with the voice like the archangel. Again, like we've talked about before, the fact that Jesus Christ calls out with a voice or a cry, and, a cry of command like that of an archangel does not mean he is an archangel. All it's saying that his vo the voice he uses is powerful like that 
of a voice of an archangel, a powerful voice. That's all it's saying here. In other words, when he leaves heaven at the leaves the right side of God the Father, right hand of God the Father, comes down to heaven at the rapture of the church, he has he shouts with the voice of uh, with the voice of the archangel. In other words, just a powerful voice, not that he is the archangel. Number five, Michael is the highest of the angels. Uh, again, an order of created beings. He is one of the angels. He is not the creator of the angels. The Bible says Jesus is. Paul wrote the following to the Colossians in Colossians 1.16, for by him, that is Christ, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. Colossians 1, 16. So again, Christ has a unique standing. Indeed, he is not in the class of angels. And then uh, another one that makes this impossible for this to be Michael the archangel, to be Christ in the Old Testament, in the uh, confrontation with the devil. Michael, we're told, would not rebuke the devil. There's a further problem with the identification of Jesus with Michael. The book of Jude makes a distinction between Michael and the Lord. Remember, it says this, but even Michael, one of the mightiest of the angels, did not dare accuse Satan of blasphemy, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. This took place when Michael was arguing with Satan over Moses' body. Again, Jude 9. Now, Michael is obviously not the Lord. He could not rebuke the devil on his own, but rather called upon the Lord to rebuke him. On the other hand, Jesus had no such problem with the devil. In fact, we find that he personally rebuked him during his temptation, since he is indeed the Lord. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Jesus answered and said, Go away, Satan. The scripture says, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left Jesus, and angels came to help him. Matthew chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Jesus rebuked Satan, something Michael was not able to do. In doing so, Christ made it clear that only the Lord is to be worshipped. No other creatures, angel or human, should be given worship. And finally, point number seven, Michael's name bears testimony to his character. Michael, the one who is closest in proximity to the Lord at the top of the angelic creation, bears testimony to the great gap between the creator and the creation. His name means, who is like God? Well, the answer, of course, is no one. The closer one gets to God, the more they realize their own nothingness and his greatness. Neither Michael nor any of the other angels, Gabriel or any of the other angels, is like God. All right, so let's sum up uh, question 22. Uh, is it possible to identify Michael the archangel with Jesus, as some people do? Now, in Scripture, there is this powerful angel, like we've just mentioned, named Michael, some identify him with Jesus Christ. In other words, in the Old Testament, there's actually Jesus when it mentions Michael. Uh, it's actually God the Son. They believe God the Son appeared as an angelic messenger who took the name Michael. And again, this is not the same as the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society idea that Jesus Christ was a created being, the first creation of Jehovah God. And he took on the angelic form uh, with the name Michael. Again, a totally different belief than that of the Watchtower. Now, support for this belief comes in a variety of ways. Michael's called the chief prince and protector of Israel, an attribute that belongs to God alone. In addition, when Christ returns to earth, he will give a shout like that of the archangel. This could be another indication. It is argued that he and Michael are the same person. Well, as we saw, while people attempt to equate Michael the archangel with Jesus, there's really no biblical evidence to do this. There are two different personages. Michael has authority over the angels, not over everything. He is one of God's subordinates who has been given charge of the angelic host, but nothing else. The Lord is the one who protects his people. And also he's called the chief prince, a title that Jesus is never called. Furthermore, he's called one of the chief princes. He is not the only one. Well, Jesus, on the other hand, is the unique son of God. 
Now, we also saw, in addition, when Jesus comes to snatch the believers uh, at the rapture of the church, he has a voice of the archangel or a powerful voice. It's not saying it's the archangel who's crying out, but the voice like that of an archangel. So you can't identify uh, the archangel here with the voice that we hear in 1 Thessalonians 4. No identification. Michael is the highest of the angels, an order of created beings, while Jesus is the uncreated second person of the Trinity, God the Son. Although Michael is the highest of the angels, he could not on his own rebuke the devil, which really settles it. Uh, he had to call upon the Lord to rebuke the devil. But Jesus had no such problem, did he? When he was tempted by the devil for that 40 days temptation at the end, we said, be gone, Satan, get out of here. Jesus did rebuke Satan. Michael could not. He told uh, Satan to leave. So finally, Michael's name bears testimony to his identity. Who is like God? And of course, the answer is no one. There's only one God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He is not Jesus Christ. He is a distinct creation of the Lord God. All right, we're out of time here for this edition of Angels, God's Messengers, His Messengers Who Are Not Seen. And so we are going to next time continue on with who is the angel Gabriel as we're going to look at uh, another invisible messenger of God, the angel Gabriel. Until that time, I'm Don Stewart. Thank you so much for watching. Until then, may the Lord richly, richly bless.